Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to the continuation of the 2021 summer lectures. As the deacons begin to come forward to gather the Sunday school offering, which is dedicated and given directly to local Christian missions organizations supported by this church, I did want to announce that next Sunday, July 18th, Harry Reeder from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, will be our summer lecturer. The summer lectures this year are on the theme, Discipleship, Following Jesus in an Uncertain World. And our speaker today, again, is a man who, in a sense, needs no introduction to this congregation, but will receive one, Dr. Dale Ralph Davis. Ralph was born in Mercer, Pennsylvania, which is in Western PA, which maybe explains some things. We'll come back to that. <laughs> Ralph was the youngest of five boys raised in the home of a Presbyterian minister. Ralph said once in an interview that he does not recall when he came to faith in Christ. He just sort of oozed into the kingdom. <laughs> Education began formally for Ralph when he left Pennsylvania at the age of 18 and went to Sterling, Kansas to attend Sterling College to study biblical studies, but more importantly there met his Sterling wife, Barbara. Ralph went on to attain, obtain and attain two master's degrees, master's number one from Union Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, master's number two in theology and biblical studies from Southern Baptist Seminary, I stumbled over those words, Ralph, in Louisville, Kentucky, and then finally his PhD in Old Testament studies. He said of the second master's degree, looking back at the Lord's providence, it was a gift to him, though at the moment of frustration to have to go and get another degree, but it sharpened his skills in Hebrew, which he did not think at the time equaled his skills in Greek. I won't go through all of Ralph's pastorates. He was a pastor of two different congregations in the area of Blue Rapids, Kansas. I'm sure a place that many of us have frequented. He has been a pastor at the, uh, lost my sight here, two different pastorates in Westminster, Maryland and in Baltimore, Maryland. He's been a pastor in Hattiesburg, Mississippi at Woodlands Presbyterian Church. He's done two different stints on the faculty at RTS, Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. They're principally teaching Old Testament. And last but not least was to our great benefit and blessing, a minister of minister in residence at First Presbyterian Church, this church here in Columbia. He's been around to a few different places. Note that many, if not most, were in the South. There's probably a story there. You weren't born here, Ralph, but you got here as quickly as you could. His ministry has been rich and widely known and blessed. I don't need to expound it. His ministry, now that he and Barbara have retired to Cookville, Tennessee, principally is the ministry of books. And among his many dozens, if you've not got in your library, his most recent set, the commentaries on the Gospel of Luke, uh, there is on the cart outside in the foyer a number of the different texts and books. His writing is like his preaching. His preaching is like his life. Ralph is fun and Ralph is faithful. Only Ralph would choose Job 19 as the text for an Easter Sunday sermon. <laughs> In a moment after I pray, Ralph will come and speak to us on following Jesus in the Old Testament. Let's pray together. God of grace, God of glory, God of eternity, God of the present and here and now, we bow before you and worship this day, asking that the light of your spirit would shine brightly upon the texts as they are illuminated, that you would give your servant, Ralph, strength 
mercy and grace, joy in continuing to run and to write after your good pleasure. Sustain us all by your grace, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Welcome, Ralph. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. And uh, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 11 if you care to, if you have your Bible. We'll be reading a part of that. It's always hard to time these sorts of things, these lectures and so on. So uh, I know this is, you, you always feel like you have to hasten through it. So it's kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant in a way. Uh, but I but, uh, kind of want to cover the ground. And so, but I do want to get the, the uh, text for you. And I think uh, Hebrews 11 verses 8 to 40 uh, will, will um, give us the background we need for, for our, our uh, lecture today. Let me just begin to read. I'll, I'm not going to read all of this section, but I'm going to read a good bit of it. Hebrews 11 verse 8. By faith, when he was called to go out to a place he was to receive as inheritance, Abraham obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a foreigner in the land of promise, making his home in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he kept looking forward to the city with foundations, whose designer and maker is God. By faith, and Sarah herself was barren, he received power to become a father, even though past age, since he counted faithful the one who promised. So it was that even from one there were born, and he as good as dead, as many as the stars of the sky for multitude, and countless as the sand by the seashore. All these were still living by faith when they died, not having received the things promised, but they had seen and greeted them from a long way off and had confessed that they were strangers and sojourners on the earth. For those who speak that way show plainly that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to turn back. But rather, they were yearning for a better that is a heavenly homeland. Therefore, God is not ashamed of them to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham offered up Isaac when he was tested, and the one who had received the promises was on the point of offering his only son. It had been said to him, in Isaac your seed will be called. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Hence, also, figuratively speaking, he got him back. Now let's go down to verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw what a fine child he was, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Instead, he chose to suffer distress along with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, since he considered the disgrace of the Messiah greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he always kept the reward in view. By faith he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's fury, for he persevered as though seeing one who is invisible. By faith he carried out the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that the destroyer would not touch their firstborn. Now down to verse 32, please. And what more can I say, for time will fail me, telling about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, brought about justice, obtained promises, closed up the mouths of lions, put out the fury of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong, though they were weak, became mighty in battle, made foreign armies flee, women received back their dead by resurrection, but some were tortured. They would not accept the deliverance offered in order that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced jeering and beatings, not to mention chains and prison. 
They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They died, slaughtered by the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, oppressed, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them, wandering over deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And though all these received approval through their faith, they did not receive the promise since God had provided something better for us in order that they might not reach the goal apart from us. Well, that ends our section from Hebrews 11. Now, you may think this is an oxymoron following Jesus in the Old Testament. It may seem like asking, did your great-grandfather always enjoy working on his laptop? Uh, we often tend mentally to confine Jesus to the New Testament. If Peter, however, was right to confess Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, then surely the incarnation, the enfleshment, was the beginning of his earthly existence, but not the beginning of Christ's existence by any means. So let me merely drop one text on you, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, when he was depicting Israel's privileges when they came out of Egypt. The text reads, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and all drank the same supernatural drink, for they kept drinking from the supernatural rock that kept following them, and that rock was the Messiah. Now, I can't go into the various theories about the background of that text and so on, but there are three keynotes there. One, continuity. They kept on drinking from the supernatural rock. Uh, this was not simply a one-time episode from, say, Exodus 17 when Moses struck the rock, but the, the Greek uh, verb there is they kept on drinking. So this was an ongoing supply of continuity. Then mobility. Paul says the rock followed them. Now that may baffle you to think of a rock following you. Uh, but the point was the rock was always where they were. Now, it, the, the rock just isn't, doesn't come out of Exodus 17, 1 to 7, but you need to realize that rock was a term used of Yahweh in Deuteronomy 32, where it occurs five times of Yahweh. He is the rock, and I think that comes in here. Uh, and then, so there's continuity, there's mobility, the rock follows them, and then there's identity, that's the third element. And the rock was the Messiah, whereas your translation probably reads the rock was Christ, but I think it's the term there, it's the a, it's a title. The rock was the Messiah. So, the Messiah was present among Israel in her wanderings, and indeed was sustaining them all through them. So if the pre-incarnate Messiah was so active among his people in the Old Testament, it is not ludicrous to consider, quote, following Jesus in the Old Testament. So that's what we must do. Now, there's one New Testament text that tells us what following Jesus involved for Old Testament disciples. And that's Hebrews 11. And to keep the treatment within bounds, I want to confine it to Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 40. And what does this text show us about following Jesus in the Old Testament? There are three elements here. First, it depicts following Jesus in various circumstances of faith. Various circumstances of faith. Verses 8 through 19. Now let's kind of rip our way through that. So what did these various circumstances involve? Well, isn't there a hint that it had to do with the unexceptional and unexciting? Notice verses 8 and 9. It talks about Abram living in a foreigner and so on and how God called him and he went not knowing where he was going. And then verse 9 says, By faith he made his home, or he sojourned, in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob. 
Now, what I mean there by the unexceptional is that sounds like a lot of ordinary time went by. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob. You think about that big time gap in Genesis, between Genesis 16 and 17. And you know, there's a blank space between the chapters in your Bible. And, and, and you just go, though, from the end of chapter 16 into chapter 17, and you think, oh, this is just a continuous story. But no, Abraham's 86 years old at the end of chapter 16 of Genesis. Genesis 17, 1, he's 99. 13 years, we don't know anything that happened. Hello, what's going on there? It's not a continuous biography, is it? What happened? Oh, I suppose pretty much what always happened. He played veterinarian for all his flocks and herds. He took care of Sarah when she had the flu. He had to watch over water rights and water supply and all the other stuff. It's not like they never had any fun at all. It's not like they didn't have birthdays or parties and so on. But there was just a lot of ordinary time went by. And he had to follow Yahweh in the unexceptional. You have to understand that Abraham did not, that the Lord didn't appear to Abraham every third Wednesday. There was just same old, same old. Um, so you see, Abraham didn't have his ESV study Bible and, and, and his copy of Table Talk devotional book so that he could go under the terebinth tree and renew his faith. No, no, there was a lot of pretty ordinary time when nothing dramatic was going on. And you have to follow your Lord then. I remember a fellow who was in a congregation my father served, and uh, he was among, well, I suppose we would uh, call them at that time holiness people and so on. But uh, he told my dad one time that, that he made a point of going around uh, to different churches where they had revival services. That doesn't mean, by the way, revival was happening. That means they had revival services. The Lord sends revival. Some people think, you know, but they call them revival services. So he would go to these revival services. He said he had to do that to kind of keep his faith juiced up. Isn't that sad? That, that you have to be on continual life support with something that's a little bit jazzy in order to keep you going. No, no. Uh, here, Abraham had the unexceptional. Now, but Abraham had to follow in another circumstance. Look at verses 11 and 12. The unlikely. Now, I can't enter into the debate about verse 11. <clears throat> Suffice it to say, I think the New International Version is better than the ESV here. Uh, we can pick at that if you want. But the text picks up especially Genesis 18. And Yahweh's promise that next year Sarah would have a son. Now you know that was a knee slapper. Because Abraham was old, and Sarah was 90, and she was postmenopausal, and yet the Lord said to them, Is anything too supernatural for Yahweh? Genesis 18, verse 14. Or is anything too hard for the Lord? In some of your translations. Now, when you hear those words, it's not an invitation for us to engage in unrestrained possibility thinking. It's not telling us that we should ask for anything from God, no matter how wild or stupid, because nothing's too hard for him to give. It's not saying, close your eyes and clasp your hands really tight and pump up your faith and ask for as much impossible stuff as you can think of. That's not what it's saying. Genesis 18 teaches that God will do what he promises no matter how unlikely it looks. It all depends on who's speaking, doesn't it? Uh, you, you know, have heard uh, Paul Bear Bryant, the, the legendary coach of um, uh, Alabama um, uh, football. Uh, but but uh, Paul Bryant was the coach earlier in his career at the University of Kentucky. 
And there was a lineman by the name of Howard Schnellenberger in, in uh, the high schools there that he wanted to nail for his Kentucky uh, football team. The problem was Howard had given a verbal agreement to go to Indiana University. And Howard's mother, another problem, uh, was, was uh, a very strict Catholic. And she told Howard, no, you gave your word that you were going to go to Indiana and you must keep your word. And uh, so uh, what to do? Well, uh, Coach Bryant pulled up in front of the Schnellenberger's house and, and uh, he had with him the governor of Kentucky. Uh, and they went in and they, they talked with them all and so on. And Howard's, Howard's mother said, no, no, uh, you, you can't break your word. You gave your word. You have to go to Indiana, no matter even uh, the, the whole pitch was made. He needs to support his own state and the glory of his own uh, domestic university, etc. Uh, so... Uh, I suppose a few days went by. Coach Bryant pulled up again in front of the Snellenberger's house, and uh, he had with him the Archbishop of the Diocese of Louisville. <laughs> and uh, when, when Archbishop came in, he, uh, he went for a walk with, with Mrs. Schnellenberger. And when they come back from the walk, Mrs. Schnellenberger said to Howard, uh, she said, you know, God wants you to do... Uh, what is best for you, he will understand if you change your mind. You see, it all depended on who was speaking. That's the archbishop that carries clout. That's the point here. If God promises, no matter how unlikely, it will come about. And you still face the unlikely, don't you? How likely is it that I in my weaknesses and sins and stupidity can be kept from falling away from Jesus? It's not likely except that Jesus has said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and they will never ever perish and no one will rip them out of my hand because he has said that. Even the unlikely can come about. So, now, then Abraham and company had to follow Jesus into the unseen. Um, you notice verse 13, and isn't, isn't that glorious? All these, he's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all these were still living by faith when they died. That's a glorious statement. Uh, oh, that that can be said of us. Now, but they were going into the unseen through death. And they even looked beyond death. The, the following verses talk about, uh, since they called themselves sojourners, they were looking for another country, a better, a heavenly homeland, and so on. So they're following Jesus into the unseen. And part of that unseen is the whole matter of death. Uh, I have a friend, um, Michael Philiber, who's a former student and friend, who pastors in Oklahoma City, uh, and he was uh, he he uh, was writing in a in a recent book of his about an experience he had when he was serving as a hospice chaplain. Uh, the the nurses in the uh, hospice facility uh, told him that there was a woman there who was apparently nearing the end. She was having some of those mini seizures that indicate she might be in her final hours. So Mike made a, a note of it, and uh, before he uh, finished his rounds that day, he finally got around to her room, he knocked, he opened the door, and he entered to find her sitting in a chair, uh, gazing into the distance. So he said, I introduced myself as a hospice chaplain and I asked her if she was comfortable and if there was anything worrying her. And he said, she turned to me with a twinkle in her eye and she said, chaplain, I'm okay. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again and that I have nothing to fear about death. But this dying thing is just killing me. <laughs> Mike said he almost fell out of his chair laughing. She laughed. 
the tears were running down their faces, and then they enjoyed one of the most delightful times of fellowship in their common faith. These, these were still living by faith when they died. They followed Jesus into the unseen. Now then, there's another matter here though. Our writer says that sometimes you follow Jesus into the unthinkable. The unthinkable. Notice, notice verses 17 to 19. By faith Abraham offered up Isaac when he was tested, and so on. And, and you notice how the writer in verse 18 shows the, the, the trouble or the contradiction in that demand of the Lord. Because the Lord had said, in Isaac, your seed will be reckoned, etc. So what's going on? You finally get the heir after all this time. Uh, and, 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 and so on. And Isaac's born, and now he's told to sacrifice Isaac. God seems to be contradicting his own promise. He's going into the unthinkable. And sometimes, sometimes you may find the Lord that way. You may find that the Lord will shock the daylights out of you. And we simply can't make sense of what he's doing. And he seems to be contradicting all his assurances of love and faithfulness. Sometimes you follow Jesus into the darkness. The good news is, Daniel 2.22, he knows what is in the darkness. But the whole experience may ring us inside out. Now, 1 Peter 1.6 speaks of believers being made sorrowful for a while through multicolored trials. That's what you see in the various circumstances, our first point, the various circumstances Old Testament believers faced. The unexceptional, the unlikely, the unseen, and the unthinkable. And Jesus led them through them all. Various circumstances of faith. Now, number two. This text speaks of Jesus in the pressing decisions of faith. Pressing decisions of faith. Verses 23 through 26. The first decision noted here in verse 23. Let's turn to it. Uh, is, <clears throat> has to do with facing the fear of man. It had to do with Moses' parents. When it says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw what a fine child he was, and they're not afraid of the king's edict. Now, why hide him? Well, you remember the situation. You had Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. This fine child, Moses, is born. But right before those two verses, you read at the end of Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, that Pharaoh had made every Egyptian citizen a vigilante, vigilante who was supposed to take any Hebrew baby boy they found and chuck him to Davy Jones' locker in the bottom of the Nile. So what are they supposed to do? Well... By faith, Moses was hidden three months by his parents. They faced the fear of man. Uh, here was a defiant faith, refusing to bend to Pharaoh's decree, filtered down, of course, through the Egyptian Department of Health and Human Services, but nevertheless, fearful for all of that. They were not afraid, it says. Now, that doesn't mean that they never had a skiff of fear, but fear did not prevent them from acting as they should. It didn't control their action. It was a time in that situation to rebel against what the government and the culture demanded. Notice it begins by saying, by faith, Moses was hidden by his parents, by faith. That doesn't mean that they had all the angles figured out. It doesn't mean that they had every possible contingency thought out. No. They knew at least this step. Who knows what's next? But right now, in this moment, this is what faith and faithfulness requires. I can't hover over this matter. I can only say that the, in the pressing decisions of faith, you may well face the fear of man. That's one of the pressing decisions. Now, let's go on to verses 24 to 26. 
not only the fear of man, but the pressing decisions of faith may mean facing the fellowship of suffering. That's 24 to 26, if you would look there. Now, several things here. There's something negative here. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It was an open-eyed, definite decision. He refused. In other words, he refused everything that was offered to him in his upbringing. Uh, He refused the silver spoon, the velvet glove, the posh life he could have had. And of course, there was another side that could have been argued, right? Right? Some people could have said, Moses, how much more effective you might be to relieve your people if you have a place among the muckety-mucks in the Egyptian bureaucracy and you can actually uh, direct, perhaps, policy that would relieve certain aspects of your people's bondage. But no, they said no. And sometimes your faith will become visible by what you refuse to do. Remember Psalm 1, verse 1. The righteous man is defined by what he does not do. So there's something negative here. He refuses. There's something calculated here. Verse 25. Instead, he chose to suffer distress along with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin since he considered the disgrace of the Messiah greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Something calculated. Notice verse 25 talks about what he chose. To suffer suffer distress along with the people of God. And verse 26 tells you why he chose it. He considered the disgrace of the Messiah greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Uh, That is, he preferred suffering, verse 25, because he considered it valuable, verse 26. That's a little too simple, maybe, but that's the logic of the text. So, faith counted the cost and took the hard way. Now, when it says, rather than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, some gruesome debauchery or anything racy, uh, but rather he simply chose... That, and decided that his place was with the suffering people of God. So, that leads us from something negative, something calculated, to something definite. There in verse uh, 25 particularly. He chose to suffer distress along with the people of God. That's clear in Exodus 2.11, you know, when oftentimes that text is neglected a little too much. It says, Moses went out to his brothers and looked on their burdens. That was the beginning, at least, of being willing to suffer distress along with the people of God. Sometimes you need to stand with the people of God in their troubles, and that may affect your decisions that you make. Uh, You've heard probably of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, German theologian. He uh, He was over in New York in 1939, um, and, and uh, doing some theological study and so on. And he came to the conclusion that he had made a mistake in coming to America. His friends over here begged him to stay and so on. But in July of 1939, he went back to Germany. Now, this would be two months later when Germany invaded Poland and the World War II would break out and so on. But, but Bonhoeffer said this, He said, I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period of our national history with the Christian people of Germany. There were Christian people in Germany. Don't forget that. I will have no right, he said, to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. He chose to suffer distress with the people of God. I'm going back into that mess and stand beside my brothers and sisters in the midst of it. But it's not always so dramatic. There must be this, can we call it, Moses way of thinking that places a high regard on the church. You see, when you 
are willing to suffer distress with the people of God, it shows you that you really esteem the people of God or the church. Um, and uh, I've, I always think of, in this connection of what Martin Lloyd-Jones said of the time when he, um, I guess maybe it was a decisive moment in his call to the ministry. Of course, back in the uh, uh, 1920s in, in, um, in uh, England and, and so in Britain, uh, Lloyd-Jones was on his way to a stellar medical career. And, and uh, he was wrestling with the whole matter of call to the ministry as well. And he had some friends come in, uh, uh, a, a relative or somebody that had just gotten married. He wanted to take his bride to see some play. Uh, in, and so uh, they went, he, he accompanied, uh, Lloyd-Jones accompanied them to see the play. And he said, I suppose it was good. He didn't remember it really. But he said, when we came out of the, the theater into the glare and blare of Leicester Square, um, there came down the street some Salvation Army folks playing hymn tunes. And he said, it so impressed him he had the sense, it just came to him, these are my people. Now, he didn't mean that, he didn't mean that he was going to become, join the Salvation Army. That's not what he meant. It wasn't that particular uh, uh, sect view of it. But it was, these are Christian people. And it just hit him. He said, these, these are my people. And he said he never would forget it. When I heard this band and the hymns, he said, I said, these are my people, these are the people I belong to, and I'm going to belong to them. It settled the matter. There's a sense in which you have to take that stance as well. If you're a part of God's people, and you're willing to suffer distress along with the people of God, it may not be in a, in a great flamboyant way. But it may mean that, well, here's, here's a fellow who has lost his wife. And you want him to know that somehow, though you may not be able to commiserate with him fully, you want him to know that he matters to you and you're going to make a point to take him out to breakfast. Or it may be praying over the phone with some woman who's just found out that she's been diagnosed with breast cancer. It, there are all sorts of ways in which you decide to suffer distress along with the people of God. And it doesn't mean going back into Nazi Germany, etc. It's very low-key, perhaps. But it's a Moses stance that you take. You're willing to suffer and share their distress. So... Those are, we've had the various circumstances of faith, we've had the pressing decisions of faith, and thirdly, I want you to notice that the text speaks of following Jesus in the strange paradoxes of faith. Verses 32 to 38, or 40, the strange paradoxes of faith. Now, look at the text there in 32 and following. Our writer speaks of the successes of faith. Verse 32 through the first part of verse 35. 35a we'll call it. Then notice that he speaks of the sufferings of faith. 35b through 38. And that both of those characterize those who walk by faith. Do you notice in verse 39 it says, and through, all, and through all these, and though all these received approval through their faith. All these. Not only those who were successful and had successes in faith, but these who went through and endured sufferings in faith. The whole kit and caboodle uh, received approval through their faith. Now, uh, look at those successes of faith in 32 through 35a. Now, I'm not going to take you through all of those, but you can find lions stifled in 1 Samuel 17 and Daniel 6. You can find fire put out, as it were, in Daniel 3. You can find foreign armies driven away in Judges 7. 
I can't walk you all the way through all of them, but you have them there in 32 through 35a. What's the point there? The point is, God does grant mighty deliverances and amazing providences to those who trust and call upon Him. You know that. God does grant mighty deliverances and amazing providences to those who trust and call upon Him. And it's not, it's not just that back there in Bible time stuff. He still does it, you know. There are all sorts of stories. You probably never heard of Maria Linke, L-I-N-K-E. She was, um, she was a German. Uh, she was married in Berlin before World War II. And uh, it later came out in a book called East Wind by Ruth Hunt. And uh, Maria Linke, though, in some way was captured or, or uh, uh, taken by the Soviets after 1945, after the war, and the Soviets came in. And they, they wanted her to serve uh, as a part of uh, the propaganda machine for East Germany. Uh, they wanted her to work for them and so on. She uh, resisted this. She was interrogated. She was tortured. Uh, the uh, interrogators would stomp on, kick her and stomp on her with their boots and so on. So then she was called in again for another interrogation. And this Lieutenant Karabroff uh, was uh, there and, and trying to say, why don't you help us out in, in, in the, our, our mission in East Germany, etc. We can make it very attractive for you, etc., etc. And uh, she simply said, well, I can't do that because uh, your regime is, uh, uh, doesn't, you know, is atheistic and I believe in God. I just can't work for you. Nothing can change that. So Lieutenant Karabroff uh, took out his pistol and he aimed it at her across the desk and... Uh, she thought, you know, this is going to be better because now I won't be, be clobbered under his boots. I'll just die real suddenly. And he said, do you still believe in God? And um, she said, your bullets have nothing to do with whether I believe in God or not. They can't kill me unless God allows it. I'm ready to go if it's my time. What you do, you have to answer for. Well, it made him so mad, he pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. As the book says, no explosion, no blinding flash of light, no angel songs, no sudden entrance into God's presence, nothing, just an angry, bald-headed man messing around with a pistol that wouldn't fire. So he adjusted it and messed with it and so on. He pointed at her again and pulled the trigger and nothing happened. And he threw the dumb thing across the floor and told her to get out. That's Maria Linke. That's, what, 1945 or so. But sometimes God does that. There are amazing deliverances, verses 32 to 35a, that he works for his people. Now, notice what the writer of Hebrews does. With scarcely a semicolon in the middle of verse 35, he says, but some were tortured. And then 36, and others experienced jeerings and beatings, not to mention chains and prisons. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they died, slaughtered by the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, oppressed, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them, wandering over deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Welcome to the discipleship of Jesus. So, uh, you see the change that takes place there. You can have all this in Jesus too. The point here in 35b through 38 is different, isn't it? Here the point is, faith does not guarantee immunity from terrible distress and need. There will be mighty deliverances and amazing providences for those who trust Him and call upon Him. That's true, but this also is true. Faith does not guarantee immunity from terrible distress and need. 
So following Jesus in the Old Testament involves mighty deliverances, but also miserable distresses. Now, the problem that we face sometimes in contemporary situations in the West, not everywhere, but some places, is that there's a tendency to cover over this contrary evidence in the last part of verse 35 through 38 and uh, kind of schmooze uh, the, the, the whole affair. Uh, I uh, happened to find a, a sample of this sort of uh, thing in uh, something my oldest brother uh, included in a Christmas letter a year or two ago. He was talking about a family that had a reprobate member in them, this Uncle Clyde, and he was a despicable character, and he was executed uh, in, in the, by the electric chair and so on. But this family member didn't want everybody to know just what a scuzzball Uncle Clyde was. So this is how he wrote up his report in the, in the family, um, I guess in the family uh, uh, letter or whatever. He said, Great Uncle Clyde, occupied a chair of applied electricity at an important government institution, was attached to his position by the strongest of ties, and his death came as a great shock. (laughs) Well, that covers up a lot, doesn't it? You never know the truth. Now, there's some people in some sometimes that want to cover over the, the, the verse 35 to 38 aspect. Uh, uh, Chuck Colson had a book, oh, this a number of years ago, uh, called Kingdoms in Conflict, and he alluded to a certain prominent evangelist uh, who was asked about his affluent lifestyle, and this was the evangelist's response. I live in one of the finest homes, I drive one of the finest, safest cars, and if a newer, safer one were to pull up in front of my door, I'd go out and say, I want it. God designed life for believers to be an abundant life. God designed for you to live in the overflow. Now, You tell that to this disciple of Jesus in the goat skin coming out of a mountain cave. God designed for you to live in the overflow. He would think you were nuts, and you would be. You see how verses 32 to 38 tell the whole truth about the Christian life. You have to hold the paradoxes together. You have to keep all the evidence in front of you. Or you get a skewed view of the Christian life. And you'll go around mouthing stupid nonsense about how God wants you to live out of the overflow. Arnold Dalmore in his uh, biography of George Whitfield. Uh, uh, told about how some, uh, some writers of, of uh, biographies of Whitfield uh, probably um, mis- misrepresented Whitfield, that what was available to them were mostly journals and, and materials from the, from the life of, of uh, uh, Whitfield in his early ministry. And, of course, there's a certain fervency and sometimes an exaggeration in in his claims, perhaps, and so on. And so they put this out as being what was characteristic of Whitfield. Uh, Whereas Arnold Dallimore, the the biographer of Whitfield, said, "If, if if you get all the materials and you get Whitfield in his mature years, it, 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 to, it, 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 um, it tones down and, and, and it qualifies those more exaggerated, uh, vibrant claims of his ministry that he may have made in the early years. Not that they were grossly false, but you just get the wrong picture because 
biographers didn't have all the evidence. They didn't have all the data. Have to beware of just using part of the data in our view of the Christian life. So, there's a text, and we've done this before, I'm sure. There's a text that you can carry around in your back pocket to keep you from getting unbalanced on this score. Philippians 3.10, where Paul says that his desire is to know him, that is Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. So you see that there? What does knowing Christ involve? It, it involves knowing the power of his resurrection. That is, the mighty deliverances that he works in your behalf. And, big conjunction, the fellowship of his sufferings the sad distresses that come as you belong to Christ. So if you keep that before you, you can go on following Jesus in the strange paradoxes of faith. You can go on following Jesus as they did in the Old Testament. Let us pray. Oh Lord, thank you that you lead us through delight and through darkness, that you lead us in triumph and you also lead us even in tragedy, that you lead us through the ordinary times and you lead us through the amazing times in order, in order that you can still be justified and say, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. For which we thank you. Amen.